Hello, hello. Thanks for joining me as I listen to Gabrielle Union. We're going to need more wine in this section. This is where she talks about going and get a kiss from this young man by the name of Kevin Marshall. Let's listen to that as she gives more detail. We'll stop at chapter four. Here we go. My parents let me go back to Omaha that Christmas. And the only reason I went was to have a chance to see Kevin Marshall and get a real kiss. And I got it. Kevin Marshall tongue kissed me on the corner of 49th and Fort, right by the bus stop. I'm pretty, I thought. Kevin Marshall, this light-skinned boy with green eyes who is not supposed to find me attractive. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Got me pretty enough I'm to kiss. Right. On the level playing field of Omaha, a guy like Kevin was a huge get having his pick of the pecking order of skin color that is in place in black and brown communities across the world. And he had picked a chocolate girl like me. Then I thought, maybe black boys like me. The next summer, when I was 15, I eased back into my blackness even more quickly. But North Omaha had changed more too. It was no longer the Disney version of gang culture. It was real. The buzz in the air now seemed more scary than exhilarating. Boys would pick Kenyatta and me up to go for a ride, and we'd end up going over the bridge to Council Bluffs because they needed to pick up some money or deliver a package. It continually felt like the beginning of a bad movie. These were not bad people. These were regular kids who got swept up in the frenzy of having to be in a gang and do gang shit to impress each other. Drive-by shootings started happening and kids began to get killed. Something very bad was coming. My cousin was dating this guy named Ryan. He and his friend Lucky were always around. Lucky always had cornrows that never appeared freshly braided. They drove vintage El Caminos. Restored status symbols they called old schools. You saw these cars, lovingly and expensively restored by masters, and knew these guys had money. One night, Ryan did a drive-by, shooting someone in the neck and paralyzing him. We saw a police sketch on the news, and my grandma said, Doesn't that look like your friend Ryan? Nope, said Kenyatta. No way, I said, thinking... That's Ryan. He came to the door later that night after Grandma went to sleep. Kenyatta let him in quickly and we sat on the steps leading upstairs. Ryan had the gun and he placed it on the ground by his feet. We all stared at it. Can I hold it? Kenyatta asked. He picked it up by the handle and she held it, aiming away from us. She looked at it with a mixture of admiration and fear. This gun had been fired and it had paralyzed someone. The whole town was looking for Ryan and here he was. Can I? I asked. Kenyatta handed it to me and I held it like you would a caterpillar with my fingers splayed out not to touch anything. It was so heavy. I thought. That's why he accidentally shot that kid. It's probably just too big a gun for him to aim. Can I stay here? Asked Ryan. It hadn't occurred to me he would ask that, but it obviously had to Kenyatta, who nodded quickly. We'll put you in the basement, she said. Grandma won't know. And we did. For three weeks, we brought him food. Peanut butter sandwiches we made covertly, leftovers from dinner, beer when we had it. We kept him company, talking about what was going on in the neighborhood. I watched some detective show where they accused this woman of harboring a fugitive. I felt like I had a secret. I was protecting a good guy who made a mistake. Police knew it was Ryan who had done the shooting, and it became clear to him that this hideout plan wouldn't last. He turned himself in. He went to prison. Lucky was killed the following summer, leading everyone to think they were the first one to say, 
guess he wasn't so lucky. Another friend got shot and had to wear a colostomy bag for the rest of his life. Kevin joined a gang, then his best friend Dennis died. A girl I knew stabbed a jitney driver rather than pay him five dollars. He lived. He'd known her since she was a baby and was able to tell police exactly where she lived, who her grandfather was, hell, who her great-grandmother was. Another boy that I thought was so cute shot up at Bronco Burgers. The mom of one of our friends decided she had to get her son out of Omaha. She sent him to Denver, and he got mixed up with gangs there. He got killed, too. None of these people changed. The environment around them did. They were all good people who made choices that ended up having insane consequences. But their hearts never changed. They were playing roles assigned to them. The same way I did in Pleasanton. When I would go back to Pleasanton at the end of those Nebraska summers, I didn't share any of those stories. The kids I went to school with didn't deserve to hear them. They were mine. And I knew I could never convince my friends of the innate goodness of Kenyatta, Kevin, and Lucky anyway. Of Ryan, even. So I would simply become the invisible black girl again. I checked my language, the cadence of my walk, and the confidence of just being in my skin. The older I got, the more resentful I became of these re-entry periods. People in California noticed my attitude was different. I was quicker to anger at slights. I wouldn't play buckwheat. I especially struggled back home after the summer of hiding Ryan. I don't know if my older sister Kelly noticed or if I just got lucky, but she took me under her wing. By then she was in college, starting out at USC before transferring to San Jose State. Immediately at USC, she found a very cool group of black friends. I was so jealous. When she got away from the house, she stopped having to be my mother sister. She was just Kelly, and our relationship changed for the better. When I was 15, she took me to a black frat party at San Jose State. It was like she gave me the keys to this kingdom of cool black people who valued education and fun. They were just worldly and cool and dope and sexy. In the way that Omaha gave me an outlet for my Pleasanton frustration, my sister's world of college became a new outlet. I looked around at these students and saw black excellence. I met an Alpha Phi Alpha brother named Daryl who talked to me for a long time that night. He even gave me his number. I gave him a fake number in return because I had lied about my age and this was a man but I held on to that piece of paper for years. That night made me see the either-or schism I was trapped in. Between Pleasanton and Omaha, I was caught in a dual consciousness. Who I had to be when I was around my own people and who I had to be in high school. Now it's easy to see how caught I was in that back-and-forth mental chess match of trying to be okay in both worlds. Two warring ideals in one dark body as Du Bois wrote, the dark body of a young girl. Each was me, but the constant code switching, changing my language, demeanor, and identity expression to fit in, left me exhausted. You were fly, dope, and amazing from birth, I would tell that girl now. From the second you took your first breath, you were worthwhile and valid, and I'm sorry you had to wait so long to learn that for yourself. Chapter 2. Sex Miseducation In the fifth grade, the girls were all ushered into the school multipurpose room where it was explained to us that we could get pregnant at any moment. Yeah. Well, at least our period would strike any minute, which meant we could hypothetically conceive a child. The problem is, Miss Brackett forgot to include the part about how we would get pregnant. Oh my she God. just left it at, it could just happen. Oh my God. No one was brave enough to ask questions, and if you don't know how you get pregnant, just that 
It might happen at any moment. That's it's a little scary. <laughs> I would lie awake at night in my room, clutching my bed in a bag twin sheets to my chin and wondering what could happen to impregnate me. If you were raised Catholic like I was, you already know from Sunday school that nothing really has to happen. You could go to sleep and wake up carrying baby Jesus. I've seen countless paintings of the Annunciation where Mary accepts the news that she is pregnant. But my favorite is Dante Gabriel Rossetti's at the Tate Britain in London. Mary is in bed giving the angel Gabriel a bleary-eyed look of, are you fucking kidding me right now? That's how we felt. Are you kidding me with this? At any moment you could become a mom stuff? We lived in a primarily Catholic and Mormon town, so our moms definitely weren't chatting among themselves about periods. When any of my friends' moms talked to them, it was to simply hand them some pads. I certainly wasn't going to talk to my older sister about it, and because I could barely decode Tampax commercials, I looked for information in books. Naturally, my friends and I turned to Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Judy Bloom's classic 1970 menstruation how-to disguised as a pre-adolescent narrative. Among us 10 and 11-year-olds, the book became required reading, and we ferreted out dog-eared copies from the local library, big sisters, and a few progressive mothers. Some girls, like me, just skipped to the blood pages. They'd hand me a copy, and I'd fan through the pages to the good parts. Then I'd pass the wisdom on to the next girl. Here, I'd say, pointing. Then here. We needed answers because it was all so scary. The idea of bleeding randomly and accepting it as natural seemed completely unnatural. After all, when you skinned your knee, you ran for a band-aid. Where's the bactine? I have to cover this. But when it came to our periods, we were supposed to be celebratory? Like our moms would suddenly initiate us into their blood cult? This was a horror movie set in the leafy surroundings of Pleasanton Middle School. It came from Melody first. In fifth grade, during homeroom. She bled right through her pants. She looked down in shock, the blood slowly blossoming in the crotch in the back of her pants. And Lucas, the boy who called me a nigger in the second grade, saw it first and reliably pounced. Melody is having her period, he yelled out, disgusted and delighted. Let's jump her! He and a few of his lackeys hooted with laughter while the rest of us looked on in horror and panic. <laughs> now, an initiate into the blood cult of adult women, Melody, of course, could get pregnant at any moment. Where was the teacher? Don't ask. Faculty lounge, smoke break. After a few excruciating moments, Melody unfroze and ran screaming. No one followed her. That included me. I felt ashamed. I was her friend, but for much of the school year, it was like being friends with a leper. Nobody else got her period for the longest time, but soon enough, all of the girls in fifth grade became familiar with Melody's month-to-month -month schedule. And when she was absent, we spoke gravely of her condition, dramatically shushing each other when a boy came within hearing range. By seventh grade, Melody was no longer alone in her period drama, as all of us were getting picked off like flies. One of our friends would stay home from school or race to the nurse's office, and then we would know. It came for her. No one I knew was excited about it. You looked forward to it the way you look forward to food poisoning. I knew that at any moment it would be my turn to stand up and everyone would point in my direction, I remember we all wore dark colors in case it happened. I began carrying my jean jacket with me at all times, ready for the big moment. I pinned concert buttons all over it of the top 40 stuff I loved. Stray Cats, Def Leppard, New Edition, Billy Joel, and tied it around my waist to conceal the inevitable evidence when the time came. We asked each other so many questions because unless we'd been struck, none of us had answers. Like... What happens? You put this pad on and then what? You're just bleeding and sitting in it? I finally became a woman in a bathroom stall at Macy's, halfway through seventh grade. I was at Stone Ridge Mall with a few friends. I felt a little dampness down below, started silently panicking and screaming, and then whispered to my friends, Oh my God, I think it's happening. 
We speed walked to the restroom, and my friend Becky, always prepared, handed me a pad. I went into the stall a girl and came out an adult. When I got home, I tried to pretend as if nothing had happened. I balled up my bloody underwear and jeans and stuffed them deep in the closet of the bathroom I shared with my older sister, Kelly. I felt cramped and sore, but I just didn't want to have the mortifying talk with anyone. I don't know why I didn't throw the clothes away. I guess it felt wasteful. Kid logic is just dumb. Weeks later, my mom found them while cleaning the house. I found your... She paused. Soiled underwear. Ugh. To this day, the word soiled still makes me cringe. She handed me some pads, offering no instructions, no sitting on the couch and patting the cushion next to her. And that was that. But I kept worrying about my next period, and I was terrified of being humiliated at school. Every month was a guessing game. When will it happen? Will everyone find out? Will guys try to jump me and make me pregnant? At first, I didn't know how to use the pads. And for a full year, I continually had accidents because my pads were riding high. Not only did I not know how pads worked, I didn't understand how my vagina worked either. And that's because, dear reader, I thought my clitoris was my vagina. I started masturbating early, age five or six. So I knew where the fun was. I knew where my clitoris was. My vagina, not so much. I'd live my life thinking, of course sex is painful because it's where you pee from. And of course childbirth is painful because you pee out a baby. Even though I'd seen a number of anatomy diagrams, I knew where I masturbated, so I assumed that was my vagina. I only discovered my vagina in the eighth grade after a year of accidents. My girlfriend, Danielle, Big D, and I were swimming at a local sports complex called AVAC, short for Amador Valley Athletic Club. And of course, I got my period. In the water, I noticed a wispy trail of blood. It was coming from me. It was especially mortifying because AVAC was as fancy as a country club with the best of everything. I frantically climbed out of the pool with Big D following and locked myself in a bathroom. She talked to me through the door. Nick, it's okay, Big D said, concern in her voice but cool as ever. She had a bookie dad and was never prudish like most of the other girls I knew then. I have to go home, I said frantically. Oh, just put in a tampon, said Big D. I'm not a whore, I shrieked. We just assumed tampons made you break your hymen. Oh so if you use them instead of pads, you are no longer a virgin. And at that stage, if you weren't a virgin in Pleasanton, you were considered a whore. What? said Big D. The record scratched. I've never used one, I whispered. Open the door, she said, and I did, but just a crack. She passed me a plastic wrapped cylinder, and I took it from her, grateful. Now lay on the floor, I heard her voice say, coaching me through it. Put your knees up and just slowly put it in. I did as commanded, laying out my plush AVAC towel and trying to put the tampon in what I thought was my vagina. It's too big, I said. What? It's too big. Let me in. I unlocked the door. She came in like the straight man in a screwball comedy. Where are you trying to put it? She asked. I was trying to put a tampon in my urethra. Um, that's not your vagina, Big D explained slowly. I let that sit for a beat. What? I said as casually as I possibly could. Now, I see, that's not your vagina, being a great title for this little one-act play. But then, I didn't see the humor. So there we were, on the floor of a bathroom at AVAC, and... Big D just slid that tampon right on up so fast I didn't think quickly enough to be freaked out. And I was all, where are you going? As if she was doing a Jacques Cousteau deep dive. And she's going down. And I was like, there's something more down there? What an amazing discovery. 
finding my vagina was a moment of interesting. Did not know that. Oh, wow. Big D was exactly the friend I needed to get me through the moment as quickly as possible. We never once spoke of it again until we were adults. Not out of shame, but from a sense of what happens in an AVAC bathroom stays in an AVAC bathroom. Only recently, when I brought it up to her, did it seem even remotely nuts. But how was I supposed to know where my vagina was? From a young age, most girls are not given the most basic information about their bodies. And we grow into smart women who often don't go to doctors on a regular basis because we're too busy putting others in our lives first and don't share personal medical information with each other either. People talk about our bodies solely as reproductive systems and we remain just as clueless as the Virgin Mary learning she was but a vessel for something greater. Thank God for Judy Bloom because at least she armed me with the basic facts of menstruation. Nowadays, girls can Wikipedia everything, or more likely, study porn clips online. But back then, all we had was Judy Bloom. She also gifted us with Forever. We all knew and loved Forever because it had the sex scene. And outside of porn, which was damn hard to procure in those pre-internet days, Forever was the only depiction of sex we had ever seen. High school senior Catherine meets fellow student Michael, who nicknames his penis Ralph, and teaches her how to rub one out before they go all the way in his sister's bedroom. We were smart enough to know that forever, not the cheesy VHS porn tapes that my trusty friend Becky had discovered in her parents' room, taught us the more accurate portrait of how sex would unfold in our own lives. Thank you, Judy. Forever gave us the truth. It was about wanting to have sex, preparing to have sex, having sex, and what happens afterwards. Judy Bloom was our tutor. During our freshman year, my friend Julie had sex at a house party with a boy she liked. They had planned to do it, but both were too fearful to go buy condoms. He told her he had a plan. So just before the big deed, he pulled out a plastic baggie. You read that right. A Ziploc. A month or so later, a bunch of us were hanging out on one of the school lawns. None of us wanted to just go home and be bored, so we decided to be bored together. We were talking about how we couldn't wait for summer when Julie started crying. She leaned forward into the circle. I think I'm pregnant, she whispered. We sort of fell into her, muffling her cries. I asked her twice if she was sure. It was such a stupid question, but I didn't want what she was saying to be true. My friend Barbara instead snapped into action. She was always very advanced and finger-snapping efficient with her asymmetrical bob and mod clothes. Okay, how much money do you have? She said. Julie shrugged. Okay, looking at us all, how much money do we have? Barbara said we needed about $350. That's what she decided was the going rate for an abortion. Over the next couple of days, like some very special Magic School Bus episode, we all, a bunch of 14 and 15-year-olds, went to our parents to make a bunch of fake requests for money to buy new uniforms or to go on non-existent field trips. In a couple of days, we got $350. The next hurdle was scheduling the abortion within the confines of the school day. To accomplish this, the lot of us cut class to go to the Planned Parenthood in Pleasanton. There was a lone protester outside. She wasn't crazy as far as protesters go, but it was strangely terrifying. She had a sign and was just there, staring at a bunch of teenagers who didn't want anyone to see us. Imagine five terrified 14- and 15-year-old girls sitting in a waiting room, hugging our backpacks. There was a basket of condoms on a little side table by the door. As we waited for Julie, I was eyeing those condoms. And sitting in a Planned Parenthood waiting for my friend's abortion to be over, I was still afraid of what the people working there would think if they saw me taking a condom. Julie came out and we all hugged her. She didn't cry. She just wanted to get on with her life. 
She led the way out the door, walking fast and with her eyes focused forward. I trailed behind, and in one fell swoop, I dumped the entire basket of condoms into my bag. No one called shotgun. We let Julie sit in the passenger seat. As soon as the car doors closed, I opened my bag to show everyone the condoms. Everyone take some, I ordered. They wouldn't. Everyone was afraid of getting caught by their parents with condoms. Fine, I said. I'll hold them. But come to me, okay? That's how it went. I became the condom dispensary, bringing them to school and to parties whenever I got the heads up. Adults weren't looking out for us. They assumed that we knew we could get pregnant and wouldn't risk it by actually having sex. But even when you know better, it doesn't mean you're going to do better. That's a lie parents tell themselves so they don't have to admit their kids have sex. And they do. They will either live with fear and baggies and abortions or live with knowledge and condoms. My dad found my stash, of course, and flipped out. They're for my friends, I screamed. That didn't help. I used the, what were you doing snooping in my room, tactic, which actually worked for once. I think he was terrified. These days, kids are mostly just honest with adults, which is just weird. I recently met a young woman in a teen empowerment seminar. I told him I wanted to suck his dick, so I sucked his dick, she said. It's no big deal. Uh Uh-oh. Um, yeah, no. Now, when I try to talk to our boys or I talk to young girls, here's what I say. Are you ready to own your sexuality in a way that you can experience pleasure as well as give it? And be truly grown up about it? But what kids are doing now, the way they process it and act on it, is so different. They would probably read forever and it would be so pedestrian to them. What kind of baby book bullshit is this? But I see their raw honesty, and I raise them. If you're such good friends that you gave him a blowjob, I asked that one girl, did he eat your pussy? Uh Uh-oh. No, she said, looking at her friends. Well, make sure he does that next time. Oh, my God. Okay. And then have him eat your ass, I said, and see where that goes. Whoa. It's called reciprocation. Other, other, it's a very unequal friendship. And I wouldn't want that kind of friendship. If you're gonna do it, it, then really do it. I want people to make informed, joyful choices about sex. Because I love sex. In the heyday of my 20s and 30s, I love the variety. Now that I'm married, I'm in a monogamous relationship. But I used to think monogamy was for suckers who didn't have options. Some choose monogamy, I would say, but most people have it foisted upon them. I just didn't see the point back then. I did, however, see the point in publicly declaring oneself to be in a monogamous relationship. It was never lost on me that society thinks a woman should be allotted one dick to use and she should be happy with it for the rest of her life. Oh my but I always God. saw sex as something to be enjoyed, repeatedly, with as many different partners as possible. In interviews, I am often asked what sage advice I have to offer young women. I admit the advice I give in Red Book is different than what I tell people over drinks. There's a gorgeous, perfect, talented young actress who I talked to at a party a few weeks ago. Look, you can't take your pussy with you, I said. Use it. Enjoy it. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Until you run out of dicks. Travel to other countries and have sex. Explore the full range of everything and feel zero shame. Don't let society's narrow scope about what they think you should do with your vagina determine what you do with your vagina. As I talked, the look on her face was the slow clap moment in movies. There was the beginning of the realization that I was really saying this, then the rapturous joy of a huge smile. She knew I meant every word. Enough with teaching people to pretend that sex is only for procreation and only in the missionary position and only upon taking the marital oath. What? If you're having consensual sex with another adult, enjoy it. So repeat after me. I resolve to embrace my sexuality and my freedom 
to do with my body parts as I see fit. And I will learn about my body so I can take care of it and get the pleasure I deserve. I will share that information with anyone and everyone and not police the usage of any vagina but my own. So help me, Judy Bloom. All right. Chapter three, Black Girl Blues. What? Here is a secret to talking to teenagers. They open up best when you're not sitting across the table staring at them. For the past year, I have mentored a class of teens around age 14. I find they share the most about what's going on in their lives when we're taking a walk. Recently, I took them out on a particularly gorgeous sunny day. As this one boy, Marcus, got a bit ahead of me, he did this stop and start fast walk, like some sort of relay race. He would stop in the shade of a tree, then sprint through the direct sunlight to stand at the next tree. What are you doing? I finally asked. I don't want to get any blacker, said Marcus. You're literally running from your blackness, Marcus, I said. You know, it's a bit much. I'm not going to win any mentoring awards if you keep this up. I checked in on him at lunch. The other secret to getting teenagers to talk is food. He explained that the relay race was all about girls. The girls he considered the hottest in school only liked the guys who looked like Nordic princes. And that's not him. You're perfect, I said. Look at my husband. He's not light-skinned, and he has not exactly lacked for female attention. So many girls are going to love you exactly the way you are. I'm not light. You get lighter sometimes, said Marcus. I've noticed. I scoffed. If you want to stay inside on a soundstage with no windows for months on end, I said, you too can look jaundiced. It's because I work inside. Yeah, well, it's possible then. So I'm just going to stay out of the sun. This kid I'm supposed to be mentoring had been sold the same ideal I had when I was young. I too went through periods where I stayed in the shade. I was obsessed with putting on sunblock and in late summer I would insist on showing people my tan lines. Look, this is my original color, I would say, proffering my shoulder to a white girl. Look how light I am. I was really saying, I have a chance to get back to that shade, so please excuse my current darkness. I learned to apologize for my very skin at an early age. You know how you tell little girls, even at their most awkward stages, you're so pretty, or you're a princess. My family played none of those games. The collective consensus was, oof, this one. I was so thin that I looked like a black daddy long leg spider with buck teeth. This is not overly earnest, false humility celebrity speak, I swear. In case I didn't know that, the world presented a relentless barrage of images and comments, making it clear to me and all my peers that most of us would never get within spitting distance of classic beauty. But I thought that at least my parents should think I was cute. When they would gather my sisters and me for a family photo, they would check each face for perfection. There was always a pause when they got to me. Ah, Nikki, what a personality you have. You are funny. In my family, light skin was the standard of beauty. This was true both in my dad's family, who were all dark-skinned, and my mom's family, who were very light. My mom was the most beautiful woman in the world to me, and I looked nothing like her. With my dad, I simply wasn't his version of pretty. His ideal is very specific. Short, light skin, long hair. I checked none of the above. Of my sisters, I look the most like my father, and I think he wanted no part of that. As for my mother, only now do I understand that she made a decision to never praise my looks because she grew up being told her looks would be enough. They weren't. Young Charissa Glass was encouraged to build a foundation on the flower of her beauty and simply trust that it would remain in bloom long enough to win the security of a good man. Her thoughts on the books she read voraciously would only spoil the moment. Shh, they said. Just be pretty. When you get a man, talk all you want. So my mom was the 19-year-old virgin who married the first guy who said he loved her. And by the time she had me, 
she'd realize that marriage was not the end all. He didn't want to hear her thoughts either. Looks had gotten her no fucking where. I couldn't lighten my skin to be considered beautiful like her, but I thought that if I fixed my hair, I had more of a fighting chance at being told I was pretty. At age eight, I begged my Afro-loving mother to let me start straightening my hair with relaxer, which some called cranny crack. Twice a month on Saturdays, she begrudgingly took my sisters and me on the hour-long drive from Pleasanton to my cousin's salon in Stockton for the taming of my hair. This is the end of the disc. The audiobook continues right, on the next let's disc. Let's change the disc and bring it up. Let's get right into it. Well, let's hold it. There we go. Take that one out and put that one in. And in the words of Slick Rick, here we go. My mother had rocked an Angela Davis afro in the 70s and did not approve of these trips to the salon. Yet she repeatedly caved to our demands that we straighten our hair, a political act of surrender on her part, or simply maternal fatigue. Either way, my desire to be seen and validated by my white peers when it came to my hair had the power to override her beliefs as a mother. I cut out pictures from magazines to show my cousin what I wanted. If I was the before, the straight-haired, light-skinned women in these pictures could be my happily ever after. One day, when I was 12, I brought a picture of Troy Bear, the biracial actress who played Diane Carroll's daughter on Dynasty. She was basically Halle Berry before there was Halle. I didn't even know that she was biracial, and I didn't know what work went into making her gorgeous straight hair fall so effortlessly around her light-skinned face. I just wanted to be that kind of black girl. This is what I want, I said. My cousin looked confused, but shrugged and went to work. The deal with relaxer was that it was usually left on for about 15 minutes to straighten hair. It's a harsh chemical. And the way I understood it was that no matter how much it itched or burned, the more I could stand it, the better. If 15 minutes means it's working, then 30 minutes means I'm closer to glory. At 35 minutes, I might turn white. But the other thing with relaxers is that the hairdresser has to rely on you telling them when the chemicals start to burn. So if you're saying, I'm good, I'm fine, they're all, shit, leave it on then. The burn is incredible, let me tell you. You start to squirm around in your seat. You're chair dancing because your head feels like it's on fire. Eventually, you have to give in because you can't take it anymore. Not this time. In my world, if there were degrees of good blackness, the best black girl was light skin with straight hair and light eyes. I don't have light eyes and I don't have light skin, but at least I could get in the game if my hair was straight. No pain, no gain. This day, I was going to break my record. I would withstand any temporary pain to finally be pretty. You good? My cousin said about 15 minutes in. I nodded. I wasn't. It didn't matter. A few more minutes went by. I could feel the chemicals searing my scalp. I closed my eyes and gritted my teeth. I told myself this pain was only temporary. When people at school saw me, I would be so grateful and proud of my strength. Every single minute counted. You good? She said again. I nodded. Finally, I began to bawl, then weep, then scream. My cousin raced me to the bowl to rinse me out. Damn it, why didn't you tell me? I ended up with lesions on my scalp where the relaxer gave me chemical burns. I was willing to disfigure myself in order to be deemed presentable and pretty. To be truly seen. At 12, I had not been once called pretty. Not by friends, not by my family, 
and certainly not by boys. My friends all had people checking them out and had their isn't-that-cute elementary school boyfriends. I was completely and utterly alone and invisible. What was it like for my mother to sit there for hours upon hours watching these black girls she wanted to raise to be proud black women become seduced by assimilation? And then to see her child screaming and squirming with open sores on her scalp because she wanted her hair to be as soft and silky as possible. My hair turned out like that of any other black girl with a tight curl pattern who'd gotten her hair relaxed and styled. Medium length, slightly bumped under, except with lesions that would later scab. Even after I was burned, with each trip to my cousin's salon, I carried with me the hope that this would be the week I was going to look like the pictures. That misguided goal remained unattainable, of course, but I could always tell the difference in the way people treated me when I came fresh from getting my hair done professionally. Oh my God, your hair looks so straight. Your hair looks so nice that way. Translation, you look prettier the closer you get to white. Keep trying. If I didn't have my hair done professionally for school picture day, I didn't want to give out the prints when they arrived. There are years where my school photo is simply missing from the albums because they were given to me to take home. If I didn't look within a mile of what I thought of as okay, I just didn't give the photos to my mother. I was not going to give her the opportunity to hand that 8x10 glossy to my grandmother so she could frame it next to photos of my cousins who had lighter skin and straight hair. I would tear the photos into pieces, scattering images of myself in different garbage cans to eliminate even the chance of piecing my ugliness together. No, I said to myself, you're not going to document this fuckery. Because I've done so many black film productions, hair has not always been the focal point of my performance. But on white productions, it is like another actor on set with me. A problem actor. First of all, they never want to hire anyone black in hair and makeup on a white film. Hair and makeup people hire their friends, and they naturally want to believe their friend who says they can do anything. Oh yeah, I can do black hair, they say. Then you show up, and you see immediately that they don't have any of the proper tools, the proper products, and you look crazy. If you ever see a black person on screen looking nuts, I guarantee they didn't have a black person in hair and makeup. I figured this out right away on one of my very first modeling jobs when I was about 22. It was for a big teen magazine, and they said, come with your hair clean. I actually washed my hair. Now, if you ask any black performer who has been around in Hollywood for more than a minute, come in clean means you come in with your hair already done. That way, they can't screw you up. You come in pressed, blown out, or flat iron. Otherwise, you're just asking for trouble. I didn't know that. My dumb novice ass showed up for my first big modeling shoot fresh from the shower. This white woman was literally trying to round brush my hair and then use just a curling iron to get the edges straight. You don't look like how you looked in your modeling photos, the hairdresser said. She hairsprayed my hair and then put heat on it. My eyes got wide. She was going to break my hair right off of my head. I said nothing and did anything but look in the mirror. I didn't have enough confidence to say... You don't know what you're doing. Step away from my hair. She did her damage, then leaned back to take in her efforts. You look beautiful. In fact, I look nuts. Then I had to do the shoot and proceeded to be documented for life looking like a crazy person. It was the bad school photos all over again, but I couldn't tear up all those magazines. When I started acting... My hairstyle determined how people saw and cast me. I played a teenager for a hundred years, so I kept a flip. That flip said, all-American nice girl from the right side of the tracks. As I was booking more jobs and meeting more and more hair and makeup people who didn't know what they were doing, I made a choice to grow out my relaxer. 
-hmm. Now, the trope in African-American hair story narratives is that this is when I became woke. Mm. It's not. I grew out my relaxer because my hair was so badly damaged, it was split to the scalp. If you're on a production that does not believe in diversity in the hair and makeup trailer, it's a lot easier to let them style a weave than to let them touch your real hair. I was also then getting a lot of attention from the type of black men that every black woman is supposed to covet, and a good number of those particular black men had been conditioned to love long hair. These two things went hand in hand. I was being chosen and validated. I stopped using my own hair probably around 7th heaven in the 90s. I have always had very good weaves, so when I cut my weave for daddy's little girls and breaking all the rules, people thought I was just crazy experimental with my hair. No, I am just crazy experimental with hair that I can purchase. After a certain point, when my natural hair was long and healthy, I just put it up in a bun. I didn't politicize my choice. It was another option. That's it. Then, because of work, wigs became so much easier to use and offered me more flexibility. My hair is braided down underneath, and every night I pop the wig off. Sometimes I leave the set rocking my own braids like Cleo from Set It Off. I still wash my hair and rebraid it. Then I can pop the wig back on and go to work. The less time I have to be in hair and makeup, the better. Still, I struggle with the questions... Does this wig mean I'm not comfortable in my blackness? If I wear my hair natural, do I somehow become more enlightened? It is interesting to see the qualities ascribed to women who wear their hair in braids or in natural hairstyles, even among black people. We have so internalized the self-hatred and the demands of assimilation that we ourselves don't know how to feel about what naturally grows out of our head. Being in an all-black production is no guarantee that your hair won't be a source of drama. Recently, I was in one and there was pushback about getting a natural no-heat hairstyle. I thought it would be an interesting option for my character. Well, we want her to be, like, really pretty. Honey, my face is where the action is, I said. Natural hair is pretty, but my face is the moneymaker. When I did Top 5 with Chris Rock... The character needed to have her hair blonde. I knew that if there were paparazzi photos from the set posted online, it would start an avalanche of Gabrielle wants to be white blog posts. So I got in front of it and posted a selfie on Instagram captioned, new day, new job, new do. I thought the message was clear. This is for a role. Don't come at me with your ats. I pressed share, and that was that. Well, that didn't work. Why did you do this was written over and over again. I felt judged. A person I never met wrote, What happened to my baby? I felt completely outside of myself in a way that was not comfortable at all. There is an idea that if you choose to have blonde hair as a black woman, you are morally deficient. I didn't just have to read it on social media. I could feel it in interactions I had away from the set. It would be naive of me to say that hair is just an accessory. I recognize that black hair has been politicized and not by us. We have since reclaimed that politicization. We have ascribed certain characteristics to people who rock a natural look versus weaves and wigs. If you choose to have natural hair, or even to promote the idea of natural hair, you are somehow a better black person than someone with a weave or someone who straightens their hair. You have transcended pettiness and escaped the bonds of self-esteem issues. But I have traveled around the world, and I know this to be true. There are assholes who wear natural hair, and there are assholes who wear weaves. Your hair is not going to determine or even influence what kind of person you are. Growing up, I was also obsessed with my nose and nose jobs. I still kind of am. I first became aware of rhinoplasty when people started making fun of Michael Jackson getting his first big one. I was on the playground, and a kid asked, how does Michael Jackson pick his nose? 
He didn't wait for me to answer. From a catalog, he yelled. I paused. Wait, that's a thing? I don't have to live with this nose if I don't want it? It wasn't just Michael. Growing up, it felt like every black star. People who you thought were beyond perfect the way they were changed their nose. The successful people who used to have noses like you suddenly didn't. It only made me more self-conscious. I would stare into the mirror, thinking about how as soon as these people got the chance to fix their mess of a nose, they did. Like them, I wanted a finer, more European nose. I used to call my nose the Berenstein Bear Nose because I thought it looked exactly like the noses on that family of cartoon bears. As a kid, I tried the old clothespin trick. I would walk around my house with my nose pinched in a clothespin, hoping it would miraculously reshape my nose. I had a method, attaching it just so and mouth breathing while I did my homework. It didn't work. There was a whole period of time in high school where I would do this weird thing with my face to create the illusion that my nose was thinner. I'd curl my upper lip under itself and do a creepy smile to pull down my nasal folds. I thought I was a nasal illusionist, but I ended up looking like Jim Carrey's Fire Marshal Bill on In Living Color. The reality is that growing up in Pleasanton and coming up in Hollywood, nobody ever said one word about my nose. I imagined people talking about my nose, but it was really just noise that originated in my own mind. People have since accused me of having a nose job, however, which made me even more convinced that people thought that I had a nose that I should want to fix. So here is the truth. I have never had a nose job. I am, in fact, the fugitive of nose jobs. Like Dr. Richard Kimball blamed for killing his wife, I too stand accused of a crime I didn't commit. It's a constant on social media. Catch me in the right light or after a contouring makeup session some might deem aggressive and the comment section lights up. Nose job. Billers. She fucked up her face. The next day, I'll post another shot with my nose fully present and accounted for and people will literally say she let the fillers wear off. It takes everything I have to not write these people and say... Do you have any idea how fillers work? Okay, I will admit I have researched. I have even fantasized about putting myself in the able hands of Dr. Raj Kanodia, Beverly Hills sculptor to the stars. A white friend went to Dr. Raj and afterward I took her chin in my hand, literally holding her face to the light like it was a beautiful work of art. We actresses talk and share secrets. So I know people who feel they owe their careers to his work. But that won't be me. I can't even get the slightest tweak because I will be slammed. I am stuck getting all the flack for a nose job without any of the benefits. Maybe one day when I'm a real grown up, I will wear my hair natural and I won't contour my nose. Hell, I'll just be me. And hopefully people will accept me the way I am. Chapter 4. The Ballad of Nikki and Little Screw. Here I am, three decades later, and it is as if I am seeing him for the first time. He just suddenly appeared, striding across the massive fields at Sports Park. It was the summer before ninth grade, and those of us who played sports year-round hung out at the park constantly. He wore a yellow polo shirt that matched a stripe in the plaid of his Bermuda shorts. And of course, he had his baseball hat on with sandy blonde brown hair sticking out from underneath. Now, that wouldn't be a color anyone would want. You would sit in the salon chair, taking its dullness and say, get rid of this. His teeth weren't at all straight with gaps dotting his crooked smile. Everyone else in Pleasanton got braces in elementary school. I was considered late to the game in fifth grade. So his gappy grin made him special. He walked bow-legged, a Marky Mark swagger to every watch step. Lucy laid claim to him first. She was the Mexican in our group of friends. 
As he walked, she told us everything she knew about Billy Morrison. Everyone called him Little Screw because his older brother's nickname was Screw. Screw looked like someone had put a palm on his face and turned it counterclockwise ever so slightly. The rumor was he'd gotten a hold of a bad batch of drugs when he was a kid, and as a teenager, his face just grew that way. But that was probably just a stupid rumor. Screw and Little Screw's parents had a tire store franchise and had just moved from Fremont. They were flush enough to move into the Meadows development, but saying Fremont in Pleasanton was an insult, so they had baggage. You heard the imaginary organ play a sudden dun-dun-dun behind that phrase. There were a lot of Mexicans in Fremont, people said, and maybe even Filipinos and poor white people. Little Screw had gone to a private Christian school before his family moved up and moved out. And over and over, this is what I heard about him. You know, he had a black girlfriend. It was always whispered with an air of, this is how wild this guy is. I had stopped being black to these folks years ago, so it was said sotto voce for the shock of it, certainly not for my benefit. But it meant I had a chance with Billy. Little Screw might be able to like me. As brown people, Lucy and I had heretofore been ineligible for the dating dramas of middle school. We were always the friend. The town was made up of Mormons and Catholics and, to this day, remains deeply conservative. Lucy, at least briefly, had luck with Jeremy Morley of the Mormon Morleys, which seemed like this unbelievable coup. But mostly, we were always the friend. At the school dances, I would always have to ask somebody to dance, blurting out, just as friends, before they thought I had some twisted idea. And certainly no one ever asked me. When we danced as a group and a slow dance came on, the unlucky one would end up with me. During Poison's Every Rose Has Its Thorn or whatever slow dance, I'd look wistfully over the guy's shoulder, suspecting he was looking at everyone else and rolling his eyes. Dancing with me was an act of charity, a -a make-a-wish mercy dance. I didn't have a model for what I was feeling until I saw the black eunuchs from Mel Brooks's History of the World Part 1. In the movie, there is an extended boner joke with Gregory Hines hiding amongst the sexless, castrated guards allowed to be in the maiden's chambers. He fails the eunuch test while the real ones pass with flaccid colors. In my heart, I was Gregory Hines with a heart on, but to everyone else, I was the eunuch. You can be the trusted confidant or witty sidekick there and in the mix, but remember, you don't appeal to anybody. Not to the whites, but also not to the very few people of color either. The two African-American boys in my grade wanted nothing to do with me. And the other two black girls steered clear of me and each other to avoid amplifying our blackness. Because anyone brown would say, well, if I hang with you, then we'll become super brown. So I was a eunuch, a social eunuch. For all of freshman year, Billy was an electric current moving through my group of friends. We would trade Billy sightings. Someone would say they spotted him at lunch or in the hall. What did he have on? We would ask in response. Was he wearing his hat? He wasn't in any AP or honors classes, so I would only see him at sporting events. He played baseball, because of course he didn't play soccer like every other Ken doll in Pleasanton. So we made sure to go to every game. When he played basketball... We admired the muscles of his arms and the tick of pulling his shirt away from his chest after he scored. He never looked around, never held up his arms in victory if he sank a basket. He just continued on as if he'd wandered into a pickup game that he might leave at any time. When I would run into Billy, it was usually at the sports park between games. I would have my bag of softball equipment and he would be lugging his baseball equipment. Did you win? He'd ask. Yeah, I'd say. You? Yeah. Cool. I'd say. Yeah. Cool. Walking away, I would feel high just from that brief encounter. Billy hung out with all the athletes, but he was close friends with Mike, whose dad was the basketball coach. Mike's whole family was made up of great athletes. The sports dynasty of Pleasanton. 
To run afoul of any of them was social death. Billy's friendship with Mike ended abruptly one night at basketball practice when Billy got into it with Mike's dad and told him, suck my balls. And that was that. But Billy seemed exempt from the social hierarchy. The incident just added to the legend of Little Screw. Billy was two years older than us and already driving. His car was the only freshman's car in the parking lot. He had a GMC truck. It was black with gold trim with Billy emblazoned on the back in tan paint. I wanted it to read Billy and Nikki so badly. He was such a badass in that ride. His parents were always away, either taking an RV trip or busy with their store in Fremont, so he and his brother had more freedom than most kids. They threw huge parties, and my friends and I always went. Our parents all worked long hours, so they never really had a line on where we were or what we were doing. I routinely used the I'm staying at so-and-so's house line when I was really out partying. There was only one parent who cared where we really were. Elisa's mom, Trudy. You never name-dropped Elisa in any of these schemes because Trudy would go looking for her and ruin everything. It was Lucy who lost her virginity to Billy first. I was so jealous, but I masked it. Tell me everything, I said, as if I was happy for her. I wanted to be the one so much that I didn't even hear her describing what had gone down. I was too busy thinking, he had a black girlfriend, Lucy is Mexican, I have a shot. The door is clearly open. Little Screw and Lucy didn't go out or even have sex again. He just moved on to Alice, another Mexican girl. Billy claimed her. He called Alice my girlfriend. I had to figure out what secret pull she had. She lived near me in Val Vista, considered next to last in the Pleasanton development caste system. Alice was on the traveling soccer team, and she was big on wearing her warm-up pants to school along with slides or Birkenstocks with socks. She always had a scrunchie to match her socks, usually neon pink. She would wear part of her hair up and the rest falling in curls. A rumor went around that she was a freak in bed. You know she rides, guys, someone told me. And then she leans back and plays with their balls. If you've never had sex, that sounds like some acrobatic Cirque du Soleil level shit. Everyone was having sex by this point, except me. Freshman year ended and I went to Omaha, where I at least had a chance with boys. The real test that summer was when I went to a co-ed basketball camp. The black guys there had a thing for me, though I was too focused on basketball to do anything. You're like a white girl without the hassle, one guy told me. He meant it as a compliment, and on some level, I probably took it as one. Nonetheless, they saw me. I was a viable option. Being the eunuch in Pleasanton, I was still in the middle of the long, long process of being friend to Billy. I wish I could say it was strategic. The rare times he would go to some kid's bonfire, I would slide on over to him as casually as I could. Southern rock was massive then, so there was always a lot of Leonard Skinner and Allman Brothers to be heard. At every party, Steve Miller's The Joker was played at least twice. You'd find young Nikki standing next to a fire, talking to a white boy in a Skinner t-shirt emblazoned with the Confederate flag. These young bucks signs of upper middle class families wishing they were back in Dixie. Away, away, and then there was Billy, looking as out of place as me. He was more into driving around playing Sir mix -a -Lot. I'd hang on to every word he said. He would complain about Alice and I would chime in, coaching from the sidelines as only a friend could do. Just tell her how you feel, I said. Just tell me how you feel. <laughs> they broke up, and my determination to be noticed by Billy only grew. At one of the parties at his house around November of sophomore year, Billy gave me a sign. He looked at me in such a way that I just knew. We should hang, he said. I felt invincible. Here's how it went. On Saturday... November 12th, 1988, Billy and I made a plan for him to pick me up at my house after I went to a Warriors game to celebrate my little sister's birthday. I still remember the score. 
the Warriors beat the Portland Trailblazers 107 to 100. I borrowed my friend Danielle's light blue denim skirt. And as my parents slept upstairs and I waited for Billy to pull up in his GMC, I checked myself in the mirror roughly 56 times. When he finally showed, I walked out the front door and left it unlocked. We drove to his house and he led me straight to his parents' bedroom. Remember how it felt as a kid when you went into your friend's parents' bedrooms? They just felt grand. Holy shit, I remember thinking, I'm not supposed to be in here. We're in here and we're going to fuck. I lay down and the panic set in. He'd already had sex with Alice, the ball fondling sex acrobat. So in my mind, I saw Alice smirking at me, always so sure of herself in those fucking soccer warmups, that neon scrunchie barely able to hold the glory of her hair. In comparison, I was so black. I was so not cool. And I was so inexperienced. Billy started to kiss me. My mind was racing. What if my vagina looked like a fucking dragon? I had another friend who was really into trimming and shaving her pubic hair. The same girl would even sometimes shave her vagina using a mirror. She would then brag slash explain to all of us using very adult words. Well, if you don't know yourself, and I don't know myself at all. And now Billy's going to see me, and even I don't know what he's going to see. Then it occurs to me. Oh my God, he's going to have sex with black pussy. I knew, even though I was so inexperienced, that in interracial porn, there is a lot of, give me that black pussy talk. And I had always thought it sounded so dirty. Now I realized that, in fact, I have black pussy. Did he have sex with that black girlfriend back in Fremont? I hadn't thought about my vagina in relation to other vaginas he'd seen. And I hadn't done anything to mine in preparation. So now, I thought, he is going to see this black teen wolf pussy. It's going to look different, smell different, be different. He's going to be repulsed. And if this doesn't go well, it will be because he is rejecting my black pussy. We got under the covers and I pulled up my skirt to fumble out of my underwear, doing as inelegant a job as possible. We left our shirts on. I'm a virgin, I said. He smiled. I later found out that was his thing. He was the deflowerer. It's not why he had sex with me, but he was known for being a lot of people's first time. He didn't even look at my vagina. He started to put his dick in, and then he looked at me trying to gauge, am I killing you? I was silent. It was uncomfortable, but it wasn't like crazy painful. And then it was. I started making this bug-eyed look that I knew could not be sexy. I flashed through every book I'd ever read that included a sex scene and landed upon the words, look him in the eye. So I tried that. Weird. It's too much to maintain eye contact with a guy when you're 16 years old and mortified. He was very gentle and so determined, like he was solving a math problem. But he still hadn't laid eyes on my vagina. I was still wearing Danielle's skirt and I started to panic because I realized that when I give it back to her, it was going to smell like sex. She would know. Because at first you don't want anyone to know, but then you want the whole fucking world to know. I waited for all the things I had read about to happen while trying to mask the pain, horror, and humiliation. It started to not hurt anymore. Maybe even feel good. And then with a strange sound, it was over. Where was the magic? Where was the cuddling? The fireworks and the I love you? Something. Anything. He got up to flush the condom, and I saw his bare butt for the first time, watching that bow-legged walk across the room. He was a dude strutting around in a white Hanes tee and tube socks. I let out a contented sigh. He was just so sure of himself that it was infectious. 
I had just lost my virginity. When he came back to the bed, we locked eyes, and all my newfound self-assuredness disappeared. I felt ridiculous. I felt exposed. He hadn't seen my black pussy, but did it feel different to him? Did he like it? Did he hate it? Is that why he came so fast? He leaned on my side of the mattress. We're gonna have to wash these sheets. Huh? You bled all over the sheets. There was no sweetness. It was simply a statement of fact, like a detective at a crime scene. I got up and I saw what he saw. It was a crime scene there on those light gray sheets. The books never described it that way. The books never said there would be this much blood. Inside, I wanted to die. In fact, I decided I was dying. A little of humiliation and a little physically. I crossed some weird boundary, turned around, and found that the door had vanished behind me. I was stuck in a weird space of Middle Earth. I had unleashed my black pussy on the world and look what happened. There's this perfect man and I've ruined the sheets of his parents' bed. I wanted to crawl into a ball and call my best girlfriend and write it in my diary all at once. And now I had to wait for a whole laundry cycle? Yes, I did. We sat there in his living room, barely talking. And as we waited for the dryer to ding, I felt myself slip sliding right back into the friend zone. I was already mourning all the flirtation, the touching, the little signals of interest. He drove me across town, back to my house. When we finally pulled up, he jerked his head toward the car door like I didn't understand how it worked. I sat. I waited. Y'all right? He said, the car was still running. Yeah, yeah. He nodded. I wanted him to kiss me the way Molly Ringwald got kissed. In my head, I was screaming, I want you to be Jake Ryan. Kiss me like that. He didn't. I let myself out of the car and closed the door softly. As I walked to my house, I pretended not to watch him drive away. Billy got back with Alice shortly after we had sex. When Billy showed interest in me, I felt myself vibrating with sexual energy. I wasn't Gregory Hines in the eunuch's chamber anymore. What's more, people could see it. Everyone around me knew that I was a viable option. My confidence swelled and promptly deflated when he moved on to someone else. For a few weeks, I remembered looking around, scanning the halls and classrooms for signs of other interested suitors. Anybody else? Anybody? No? No. I was back to eunuch status. But now I'd had a taste. I knew what was on the other side. I wanted a do-over. Later that school year, I got it. It was in February. Billy and I had sex on the ground outside an industrial park. I drank a Mickey's Big Mouth. This time, I thought, it was for real. That one didn't do the trick either. (laughs) We did have a pseudo-romance of sorts and hooked up many more times. Throughout my teens, I never dated a guy without cheating at least once with Billy. Even now, I Google him. I'll be with someone from Pleasanton and he'll come up in conversation. The other person might say, I wonder what he's, and immediately it's, hold please, as I start typing. Or if I'm with a mutual friend from home and they have a laptop open, I direct them, go to his Facebook. I don't want to actually connect. I just want to be a voyeur. I want to see how his kids turned out. I want to see if they're ballsy like him. But it doesn't matter. As many times as we hooked up, there would never be Billy and Nikki painted on the back of that GMC. I was never his chosen one.
All right, let's stop it right there. And uh, I guess we'll talk later. That's getting good. We are going to need more wine. Gabrielle Union, thanks for listening. Talk later. Bye-bye.